and silently toward it, expecting each moment to hear the eerie flutter of a cat's invisible wings or feel its fleshless fingers on his throat. Once he glimpsed a moving shadow near an alleyway and sped faster, telling himself forcefully that it was a cat. Cat or keft, by the time he reached the distant doorway, he was weak with fright. But he thrust his torch into the flame, made himself wait while it caught well, and, whispering what he could remember of the incantation against evil spirits, stumbled back the way he had come. Safe once more inside the court, he leaned a moment, panting against the wall. He had fetched the light. He had not been seen. The kefts and cats had stayed away. Now if only Gebu did not come back and catch him at this. He hurried upstairs to the door and thrust the torch into the wall bracket beside it. Scooping the clay crumbs into his palm, he spat on them, softened and mixed them with a careful finger, then pressed them into the crack and smoothed the edges as well as he could. A sliver of palm fiber off the torch handle made a poor enough engraving tool, but it was all he had. With it, he scratched in the missing bits of the scarab mark. It was done, but his heart sank as he saw how crude the patching looked. It would never pass Gebu's inspection. I must run away, he thought. Gebu will kill me. I must go quickly. But where? He had no place to go, and the night was thick with dangers. Stumbling with fatigue and with the trembling weakness which follows fright, he went downstairs once more, extinguishing the torch and replacing it in the oil jar, then flung himself on the familiar roughness of his mat. He would rest here just a moment. Then, kefts or no kefts, he must slip away through the streets and perhaps steal on board a Nile boat bound for Menef or Abydos in the morning. Perhaps an hour later, a sound in the darkness brought him bolt upright. Had he slept? He must get out of here, now, at once. He sprang to his feet, then froze at the sound of a muffled crash upstairs, followed by a stream of oaths. Gebu was home. He had seen the seal. It was too late. He ran toward the gate, only to whirl and run back again as he heard the upstairs door crash back against the wall and Gebu's staggering footsteps sound in the passage. Gebu was very drunk. He stumbled and half fell down the stairs, cursing at the top of his voice. Ranefer shrank into the darkest corner of the courtyard, wishing he could disappear into the bricks of the wall. He heard an angry, sleepy voice from the next house. Quiet, son of pig! Can't a decent man rest? Gebu roared some blurred profanity in answer. Ranefer, pressing still closer to the wall, watched the gleam of moonlight on Gebu's shanty as he wavered across the courtyard and into the storeroom. There was the familiar sound of a mug clinking against the water jar, then a tinkling crash of broken pottery. Gebu emerged and stood a moment, swaying. Then, miracle of miracles, he staggered to the stairs and climbed unsteadily up them. A moment later, the door of the upper room banged shut. Stunned at first, Ranefer gradually realized that he was safe. Gebu had not even noticed the seal. He had been too drunk. The boy's breath escaped in a quivering sigh. He left his corner and went back gratefully to his mat, thanking all the gods of Egypt for the invention of barley beer. Weary, sore, and still supperless, he fell at once into exhausted sleep. He was roused at daybreak by the usual rude dig of Gebu's sandal in his ribs. Up with you! Make haste to the shop! You can buy a loaf on the way! Gebu tossed a copper to the paving. Ranefer groped for it and, rubbing his eyes with his knuckles, stumbled across the courtyard still half asleep. The cold water on his face helped wake him, and a careless touch on his hurt lip jogged his memory. Something important had happened. Suddenly, he was wide awake, remembering everything. The seal, his fear, the golden goblet. Last night, he had been too concerned with immediate problems to think about the goblet. Now, it filled his mind. He turned down the street of the crooked dog and into the dusty thoroughfare, which was stained pink with dawn and already dotted with the scurrying figures of men on their way to work. He knew he must eat. He was too foggy with hunger now to think what this discovery meant to him. Near the street of the sailmakers, he spied the baker's boy, Kai, emerging from his master's shop with a laden basket on his head. Kai turned at Ranefer's hail and lowered his basket. Yesterday's baking, he remarked laconically. No matter, Ranefer retorted. I have yesterday's hunger. He snatched one of the flat, round loaves and bit ravenously through the glazed crust, handing Kai his copper. You get two for a copper when they're yesterday's, Kai said. He handed over another loaf, 
starting to raise the basket to his head again, and hesitated. Take three. Nobody need know of it. You had best put Nile water on that broken lip of yours. With a sympathetic glance, Kai hurried off. Ronefer tucked the third loaf into his sash for midday and went on, more slowly now, toward the shop, eating as he walked. It is the most important thing that ever happened, finding that goblet, he was thinking. I will be free now, and Gebu will hang head downward from the palace wall. It is right, it is just. He stole a treasure from the precious habitation of that great king. That is a terrible evil thing to do. I will tell someone right away. I, Ronefer, the son of Thutra, will make the crime known, and then the soldiers will come out of the palace and snatch Gebu. And he will be gone forever. He will never beat me anymore, and I will be free of him and free of the stone shop, and everything will be like a wonderful dream. All Egypt will thank me. Pharaoh himself will thank me. He will summon me to his courtyard for the shower of gold. He will hang golden collars around my neck and order flowers strewn in front of me and tell Zau he must take me as his pupil. I will be rich and happy and eat roast waterfowl every day. I have only to tell this thing. An old familiar question broke in on his daydreams. How was he to tell of it? Take the goblet from the chest and show it to a soldier? But he would be accused of stealing it himself. Go to some noble then, or seek an audience with a priest of Amun? Impossible. An insignificant stonecutter's apprentice would get no farther than the first guard. Even if he managed to tell someone, there would be Gebu to deal with. Would anyone take an apprentice's word against his masters? No, it would be he, not Gebu, who would end up hanging from the palace wall. It was all the same as before, when he wanted to tell about the wineskins. The questions had no answers. The problem, no solution. Nevertheless, he worried it as a dog worries a bone while he doled out cutting sand for old Zahotep's drill. Suddenly, at mid-morning, the idea came like a flash of sunshine. Zau, Zau the goldsmith was known at the palace itself. The soldiers would trust his word. But would Zau trust Ranefer's word? Ranefer was not sure. Still, Zau might believe it if he held the goblet in his hand. Surely he would believe then. The first step was to steal the goblet out of the chest. The sand, boy, the sand! Zahotep's voice crackled with impatience. Do you think this drill is made to toy with like a lotus flower? If Pai sees me idle here. Ranefer hurried toward with the pinch of sand. Zahotep set the bit of the drill into the hole again, still grumbling. If the master were here, I'll wager you'd need no reminding. And where was the master? Ranefer thought as he stepped back. Gebu had not appeared this morning, though it had been his custom lately to come early to the shop and stay most of the day. He might show up at midday, but if he did not, the noon hour would be a perfect chance to slip away home and take the goblet. Gebu did not show up at midday. After waiting a last nervous few minutes, Ranefer wandered casually from the shop and, once out of sight, ran like a hare. He shrank from the very thought of breaking another door seal and repeating the nerve-wracking process of mending it, but there was no other way. Breathless, he reached the courtyard gate and pressed his ear against it. All was still. Cautiously, he stepped inside, padded across the empty court, and listened again. Then he climbed the steps, silent as a wraith. Immediately he knew that Gebu was gone, for the door at the far end of the passage was bolted on the outside. But, wonder of wonders, it was not sealed. The gods were with him. An instant later he was inside the room and searching frantically through the wooden chest. The goblet was gone. Dazed by the collapse of all his hopes yet another time, Ranefer started back to the shop. So certain had he been of finding the goblet waiting for him that even now he could almost feel it in his hands. Where had it gone? Maybe into some melting crucible, though it made him sick all through to imagine it. Maybe into the bale of linen in the hold of some northbound Nile boat, probably Setmas, to be sold in some other city downriver, or even in Crete or Phoenicia or Mycenae. In any case, he would never see it again, and soon Gebu would be wearing a fine new armband and swaggering when he walked. From habit, Ranefer's feet took him along the thoroughfare, past the lane that led between the flower fields toward the river, but his mind was so full of the goblet and his despair that when the ancient suddenly appeared from the lane and hurried toward him, he had to stare a moment to realize who it was. Then he wanted only to escape. He could not tell anyone about the goblet, not yet, perhaps not ever. 
Oh, I, I cannot come to the thicket today, he stammered. It grows late. I must get back to the shop. Tell Hecate I will see him another time. He tried to edge around the ancient, but the old man caught his arm. Hecate has come and gone, young one. I waited in hopes of a glimpse of you. I have something to report. Aye. The ancient chuckled as Ronefer's attention suddenly riveted on him. I've been spying again, without really intending it, I confess. And this time I saw something. I did indeed. You would saw something? Ronefer repeated. The goblet, he thought. Could he have seen the goblet? Could he know where it is? I saw a quarrel, a bitter one. Ronefer, who had opened his mouth to ask straight out about the goblet, closed it again abruptly. The ancient nodded in a conspiratorial manner, winked his one eye, and chuckled again as he led Ronefer into the lane where his donkey was snuffling morosely along the baked roadside ditch in search of a blade of something green. Come, I must keep an eye on Lotus while I tell you. It was Setma and that Gebu of yours who were quarreling. Only an hour ago it was, on the edge of the papyrus marsh close by the fish docks. I was there cutting my day's load, no more than three cubits away from them, though they could not see me for the reeds. Hi, but they were angry. They all but came to blows, and I wished they had. That would have been a fine treat now, wouldn't it, young one? But what did they say, ancient? What was it they quarreled about? Gold, my boy, what else? When two rogues like that fall out, you may be sure it is over the price of some skullduggery one is to do for the other. I think that young scamp Hecate is right. Setma has been taking whatever Gebu steals and selling it for him in another city. But it's finished now. Finished? Ancient, what did you hear them say? They whispered, young one. They hissed and spat and growled at each other, but all in whispers, angry as they were. I caught only a few words. One was never. That was your stonecutter. Another was dangerous or danger. It was Setma saying that. Then Gebu said, a third part, no more, no more. There was more hissing and snarling, and a few fine names they called each other, but I heard nothing more of interest until Gebu swung away and walked past the edge of the marsh, so close to me I could have touched him. You're finished, he was saying. There are other captains on the river. I stood quiet as an image, and he went by me and away toward the docks. When I looked again, Setma was gone too, and good riddance to them both. It seems quite clear what they were saying, Ronefer said finally. Aye, they've parted, that is certain. No doubt Setma raised his price and Gebu would have none of it. So what of the goblet? Ronefer was thinking. What will he do with it? Did, did Gebu, did they have anything with them? He asked cautiously. Anything with them? Oh, gold, you mean. Nay, I think not, young one. I saw no pouch nor packet of any kind. Of course, the reeds were in my way. Gebu carried something under his arm but it looked to be a bundle of old clothes, nothing more. I see, Ronefer said, as well as he could for his heart jumping into his throat. A bundle of old clothes such as he had found in his chest last night, a bundle of old shenties with the golden goblet inside it. He left the ancient to his afternoon's reed cutting and hurried back to the shop. Gebu was not there. He had not been there during the midday either, as Ronefer found out by casual questioning of Zahotep. He did not appear all day, though Ronefer watched for him constantly, his head buzzing with questions as he worked. At the day's end, he hurried home, but Gebu was not there either. A glance up the stairway showed the door at the top still closed but unsealed, exactly as it had been at noon. What if he is gone for good? Ronefer thought as he walked slowly toward the storeroom. Nay, he could not be. He would not leave while he is growing rich, while there is so much stealing to be done the whole valley of the tombs with all the treasure in them. He shivered and stepped into the storeroom. If only someone would catch Gebu. Suppose a soldier should see him sneaking into the valley or coming out of it with stolen gold or should catch him walking about the streets right now with that bundle under his arm. Suppose someone had caught him. It was not impossible, was it? It would explain his absence from the shop all day, his absence now. Suppose he was in Pharaoh's prison this minute, or being dragged before the judges, or... Happy possibilities were still racing each other through Ronefer's mind when he heard the gate crash open and Gebu's heavy footsteps start across the courtyard. Slowly, Ronefer put down the water jug, feeling his whole spirit wilt and the old burdens settle down on him again. The footsteps had almost reached the stair when something occurred to him. 
Darting to the storeroom door, he peered out cautiously. Gebu was just turning to climb the stair, but in the instant before the angle of the stairway hid him, Ranefer glimpsed a bundle under his arm. So he had brought the goblet home again, because of the quarrel with Setman, no doubt. Because he had so far found no other riverman who would smuggle his treasure out of Thebes. It might be days before he found another, it might be weeks, and meanwhile the goblet would have to stay in that room upstairs, hidden in the chest. The gods have given me another chance, Ranefer thought joyously, and this time I will not bungle things. I will not wait for any days to pass. I will take the goblet tonight, as soon as he goes out. Gebu came down the stairs again almost immediately, carrying a packet of bread loaves which he had evidently bought on his way home, for they smelled deliciously of new-baked crust. He paused when he saw Ranefer standing in the courtyard. You're early home for a change, he growled. I have only just come, Ranefer said, hoping the lie would be believed. He did not care to set Gebu's suspicious mind working on any unusual behavior of his. He must remember hereafter to come and go exactly as always, at the same hours, in the same way. Evidently, Gebu did believe, for he merely grunted and walked on to the storeroom, jerking his head for an effort to follow. There he untied his packet, and leaving the loaves scattered on the shelf, broke the seal on the barrel of dried fish, extracted two, and put them on an earthen plate. Ron Effer, who had expected to be asked at once for his coppers, stood holding them in his hand and watching hungrily as Gebu resealed the barrel, put a couple of loaves on the plate, and, taking it with him, started out of the storeroom. Don't you want my coppers? Ranefer asked in surprise. Gebu halted, turned with an oddly abstracted air, and held out his hand for the coins. An instant later, he turned back again, gave Ranefer one of the fish, went on to the next storeroom, emerging an instant later with an oil-soaked torch. Without another glance at Ranefer, who was standing astounded with a whole dried fish in his possession and the knowledge of three bread loaves unguarded on the shelf, he climbed the stairs and banged the door of his room behind him. In a moment, Ranefer heard the whining scrape of his fire drill as he worked to kindle the torch. Obviously, Gebu had a great deal on his mind, or he would have never forgotten the coppers or those other loaves or permitted his gutter-waif half-brother to keep a whole fish for himself. Ranefer thought he could guess the causes of this strange preoccupation, and his guesses gave him considerable satisfaction. It could not be comfortable having a stolen treasure in one's possession and no way to get rid of it. It could not be pleasant, either, to realize one had made an enemy of a rogue like Setma, and to wonder how soon and in what way that rogue might inform against one. Ranefer thought about that a moment, hopefully, then decided he dared not count on Setma's malice to help his own cause. It might be a long time before Setma found a way to inform on Gebu without informing on himself as well, and during that time Gebu might have found another smuggler, and the goblet would be gone. Nay, tonight is my chance, Ranefer told himself. Let him seal the door or not. As soon as he leaves for the wine shop, I'll go up those stairs. Then I'll take the goblet and run to Zau, even if it's midnight. I can wait. Meanwhile, he had a feast to eat and plenty to save for morning, and the enjoyable knowledge that Gebu had a few burdens of his own for once. Hours later, he finally accepted the dismaying certainty that Gebu had not the slightest intention of leaving his room at all that night. Very well, then, he told himself uneasily. I will come here tomorrow, at midday. The goblet will still be in his room tomorrow. It must be. Let him hide it ever so well. I will find it somehow. He woke the next morning just in time to see Gebu cross the courtyard and let himself out the gate, with the bundle of shenties under his arm. Ranefer was up in a moment and after him, pausing only long enough to assure himself of a safe margin of distance between them. Gebu walked down the street of the crooked dog toward the river, turned on a broad street leading southward, past the fish docks and ferry landing, with Ranefer never losing sight of him a moment. Presently, he turned again, at an all-too-familiar corner, and in another five minutes was walking straight into the stone-cutting shop. Ranefer stopped in a nearby doorway and stared after him, bewildered. Of all the moves Gebu might have made, this was the least to be expected. Why would Gebu take the goblet to his shop? How did he dare to? Where would he hide it? The whole idea seemed insane. As soon as Ranefer felt reasonably safe in doing so, he walked quickly into the shop too, trying to appear as if he had merely come to work as on every other day. 
he did not risk so much as a glance in search of Gebu, but shortly after Pa'i had set him working at his first task, he saw Gebu emerging from the scroll room. His hands were empty, swinging by his sides. There was no sign of the bundle. He walked straight through the shop, spoke to Pa'i a moment at the entrance, then vanished into the street. It was an hour before Pa'i needed a plan from the scroll room. The instant he bellowed the familiar order, Ranefer was flying across the gritty floor as fast as his feet would move. Once inside the little room, he looked frantically for some sign of the bundle, some place it could be hidden. There was nothing. In the dusky light that filtered through and under the roof thatch, the shelves looked the same as ever, several tiers of them lining three of the walls and a cupboard beside the door on the fourth. Ranefer looked more closely at the cupboard. It was as dusty as everything else in the room, and its small doors were not sealed. Nothing could be in it except tools and cutting sand, as always. He looked to make sure, opening the doors gingerly with his fingernails so that he would leave no signs of his prying in the dust. Inside were tools and cutting sand. No more. Still, Gebu had come into this room with the bundle and come out without it. Ranefer, came Pai's bellow from the shop. Ranefer snatched the scroll he had been sent to fetch and ran. He would look again. He would search whenever he got the chance. It must be there. It must. It must, he told himself, ready to burst into frustrated tears. But where? How could anyone hide it on those open shelves? It was not in the cupboard. It was too big to thrust into a scroll. Later that day, he searched again, prying hastily through piles of scrolls and hastily restacking them, staring defeated into that dusty, innocent cupboard. Gebu did not return to the shop that day and when he came home at sunset, he had no bundle with him. For all Ranefer could find of it, bundle and goblet alike had vanished into the air. Chapter